So welcome. Hi, I'm Robert Ross, Tactical Slash Strategic Marketing Manager for Gleaner Combines. And we're here, Aaron, uh, episode two of Gleaner Online. So got a lot of exciting stuff. Tell us a little bit about what we're going to see here today on this episode. Well, we got really three important things that we were, and really exciting things that we wanted to share with you. First off, we wanted to capture a moment here in Gleaner history and in, in Heston facility, the manufacturing facility here, a little moment snapshot in history. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, we're going to talk a lot about a main component, a very big feature, one of those important features for the Gleaner Combines in the mainframe and why it's so important to our customers and what makes it so important to Gleaner Combines. And then finally, I think you and, and Josh Wagner of the Tech Band kind of go through a walk around the machine and how to get it ready for harvest and some of the tips and tricks that you can do to make sure, I mean, nobody can guarantee against failure, but you can stack the odds in your favor by going over the machine beforehand and right. making sure that we catch everything we can catch before we get into get the, harvest. To the harvest field. Absolutely. Well, this sounds like an exciting show. It's, it's a very coming, exciting, right? a lot of stuff coming at you too. All right, very good. Well, let's so, get started. So yeah, so the first thing that we wanted to talk about is that that moment, that snapshot in history. Um, we wanted to, to really capture this moment for both Gleaner and for the Heston manufacturing, because it's a centennial, right? It's a hundred years. Um, we've talked about it a lot. There's not a lot of companies, not a lot of other brands that can say they've been around for a hundred years. Absolutely. So we wanted to capture that snapshot and really kind of take, take a picture. And, and really the people here in Heston, we've been working here long enough together that we really kind of see each other as family. So that's why we called the project the, the Family Portrait. Hmm. also wanted to share some of the history and the significance of the moment with the people that make the gleaners of today possible. We included images of the gleaners of the past in the field and pictures of the folks and facilities that made them. It's important for these folks to know that they are part of the 100 year story of gleaner combines and they should be proud of their contribution. Much like a true family portrait, getting everyone together to take a picture was a challenge. With the help of Melissa Blaylock, the administrative assistant to the site manager, we were able to coordinate with the different plants of the Heston site to get everyone from each of the multiple shifts an opportunity to be included. One hundred years, that is an accomplishment that there's not too many brands out there of anything that can say say that. All of that doesn't happen without all of this team, right? All the people here at the plant. Each one of you is what makes this come together. Without this team, the customer doesn't get the experience of a Gleaner Combine. Since we didn't have an area to hold all 1,500 employees at the same time and get them all to fit into a single camera frame, we had to take photos of each individual group and combine them into a larger image. The resulting banner that will be hung in each of the plants here in Heston is a total of 25 feet long. So Aaron, we just uh, got a chance with the with the picture of the, the entire plant here. It, that was an incredible day, right? Yeah. Working through that many people, bringing that together. And you know, we talked about during that as we brought those people in here, you know, what a difference each person makes here in Heston. And, and without all these people coming together and building this combine, 
the experience for the customer doesn't happen. It doesn't right? happen at all. And and I think being able to pull this together and show them how much we appreciate it as well is just a huge thing. Something so, special. Right? Absolutely yeah. it is. Absolutely. So and I and I think that snapshot really captures what we do here in Houston. You know, folks from, from different places with different backgrounds coming together with a common goal of making the best harvesting equipment that we can make and doing it by putting the farmer first and doing it every day. I mean it's really it's really something personal to me because these folks they, they keep me doing what I love doing right it's Absolutely. going out talking about greener combines and showing our customers what makes them so great so Aaron you got a chance to to mm -hmm. visit with some of these uh, very close conversation with some of the guys yeah, that absolutely. held this combine for us. Yeah, and it was it was great. I, went, I was out in Plant 3 where we do a majority of the welding and I talked to Cody, Rojo, and Tim and they're, they're responsible for welding together the mainframe of the combine. And, and we got to see some of the, the, the dedication, the care, and the really detail-oriented abilities they have to be able to weld this frame together and, and we kind of shared some of the some of the benefits of what that fully welded mainframe brings our customers so Absolutely. it's a really great opportunity and I, I can't wait for folks to see it yep gleaner combines have used a fully welded mainframe from the beginning having a fully welded mainframe gives the gleaner combine some significant advantages the fully welded mainframe of a gleaner combine is really the foundation of the machine at any time you're building a structure you want to start with something to build off of, and that's what we've done here. But so the all welded mainframe, as you can see, becomes a structural foundation of the complete entire machine. The next thing that you're going to see come on here is the processor, right? And the processor now becomes the next part of the structure that's building off of this mainframe. So we're not having to add weight and stability because each component now is feeding off of the next one, just as the processor does up here. As we set that on there, now the process, processor becomes part of the structure of the combine also. And you'll see things like the grain tank is supported off of the processor. So everything just starts really come together in a modular design, but it helps us keep the weight down, but keep the structure very sound and very solid. But it gives us the ability now to keep our machine lightweight, but not give up any of the integrity of the at the foundation or the strength in the machine. You'll hear us talk about straight through drives, right? And straight through drives means we got this shaft running clear through the machine and it's driving two different operations at that point. That simplifies the overall process. But the whole time we're doing that, in order to be able to do that, we've got to have a strong frame. And that's the purpose of the all welded mainframe. And what that means for you as a customer is more reliability, fewer parts, less cost to operate, and we can be more efficient because we're keeping our weight down, but we're using it in the right place, so we're not giving up any strength on the machine itself. So one other area, when we talk about the mainframe, we talk about the straight through drives. The other aspect of this, I talked about the simplicity of it, but the other part is the reliability because if we keep everything square, and it's, and it's very foundational strong, that improves the overall bearing life of your shafts. For these shafts that are running from one side to the other, whether it's the main shaft, the fan drive, you have your unloading auger drive coming across as well. Keeping that alignment is going to make those bearings last longer and everything runs more efficient. So when you start talking about how important the all welded mainframe is to a gleaner combine, it it just goes on and on the benefits of why it's important. And we want to make sure that everybody understands that the quality that goes into this and the thought pattern that went into the design to make it a well-balanced, simple, efficient combine starts right here. The mainframe starts out as three different pieces, two sides of the mainframe and the auger trough. Those three components are welded together on a stationary jig. Each of the thousands of welds on the mainframe are vital. Special care is taken to be sure the welds are up to their high standards. This is a pretty pretty crucial thing. So they're, they're, they went through pretty deep. So we gotta make sure that our welds are, are off par. We can't have too many pinholes. We can't have frosty. They can't be uh, inconsistent. It has to be, it, it has to be there. You have to really pay attention to what you're doing. Taking your time. Yeah, make sure you don't, you don't see anything, hear anything that's going on wrong. Yeah. If I start hearing it popping, yeah. and I'm getting porosity, it's like, uh, yeah, that's the welcome break, all yeah. the air in there. 
Tim has been welding the mainframe of the Gleaner Combine since production was moved from Independence to Heston, and it wasn't always such a straightforward process. They handed me the print. Okay. All right, where do you start? And then you got to looking at it. Well, I guess it has to be the seal first. Goes in, and you put the belly pan in, and you got to set up the front post and all that, pivot. And then you start setting in the side, and just trying to figure out the sequence of that is amazing. It took a while to figure it out. From the stationary jig, Cody and Rojo move the frame to a rotisserie so the frame can go through finish welding. This is the last process. We call it finish weld. Before we send it off the paint, and we're done with it. Throw all the parts in, finish weld it. We'll turn it, hit all the welds that we need to. Uh, we're gonna just gonna weld the gussets, the cross members. I gotta put a few welds on this. A lot of paying attention to detail, and it's easy to miss things if you're not. Then you got quality on you, and uh, nobody likes that. We gotta weld everything on the inside. It'll turn. It'll turn four times before we're done with it. Before it's done for us, there's not too much to it. It's gotten simple for as long as we've been doing it. And after we get done here, we'll send it over the mill. It'll get milled down into spec and then shipped off the paint and then over to assembly. And it's the first thing on the line. And from there, it turns into a combine. So we mill this front axle when it goes into the combine or prepping the, the main frame itself. There's four surfaces, two on each side, where we actually mill both the axle and the mainframe so that then when this thing bolts together, everything is square because we want to keep that strong strength that we put together in all of this mainframe. The other area will be back here where we mill that, when again, that's where the axle is actually mounting up to the mainframe itself. So again, paying special close to all these details gives you a strong foundation to really build the combine on that'll last for you. When finished milling, the frame is moved to plant four for paint. The entire frame is dipped and painted. Much like anything built here in Heston, the mainframe takes the hard work of many people to get it right. It's really a team operation. If one of us isn't here, um, it just doesn't work. It's a, it's a three-man operation. There's no way that uh, you can get this done without us working together. Every day we have to work together. If that doesn't happen, the frame can not go out. So Robert, that was a really great opportunity to really uh, talk to guys that are really on the line, putting this stuff together. Because when we're given tours on the, on the line, we don't have a lot of time to stop and really get into the intricacies or the details of what the guys are doing on the line. So the fact that we were able to, to be there with somebody as, as dedicated and passionate as, as Cody, Rojo, and Tim, it was really just a great opportunity. And I, I really appreciate their time and their effort oh, and right. everything they do. Absolutely, and, and that is part of our tour, right? We mm -hmm. always start out there. This is where the combine starts, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you're right, we're on a schedule and we're trying to show a lot of things, but this really gives us a lot of detail. Gives that detailed too. information. That a lot of folks are looking for and like to see, so. So Robert, you had the chance once the machine was all together to kind of walk through and do a walk around with somebody about how to get the machine ready for harvest? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Josh Wagner, who oh, yeah. is a supervisor for our tech van, right? Getting ready to uh, to head out and serve his combine. So Josh and I did a walk around and he pointed out some really good things and tips. And we're going to see that shortly. Oh, that's great. Uh, you know, okay. part of the Gleaner Online that we talked about when we first started was we're going to give you some tips maintenance tips, performance tips, and those types of things for your cleaner combines. So with me here today, I have Josh Wagner. Josh is our supervisor out there on our tech van, and he deals with these combines all summer long, knows the ins and outs of them. And we brought Josh in to kind of go around the combine with us today and show us some of the things that, that you'll want to do to your machine before you head to that wheat field uh, this summer. So Josh, uh, why don't you take us around the combine? Okay, thanks Robert. We'll start up here on the front side of the combine and work our way around. So what we want to start with here is our variable speed header drive. And we've got our safety stop in place. We want to pop this shield off. There's a couple of grease circs in here that do get overlooked. We've got two out here, but there's also grease circs in behind that get missed. These should be greased every day. This keeps your variable speed, speed torque moving. It can 
bind up if we don't get enough lube in it, which will let, not let this belt work and, and your feeder house work efficiently. So Josh, one thing, you know, you, you talked about this being the variable speed, but it's just as important to grease it when you've got your draper head or your uh, rigid grain head, whatever you might be running on there too. Maybe explain a little bit of why <clears throat> that's important. Absolutely, Robert. So as we're going through the field, not every field is ideal conditions. So when wads go in, these shivs will sit there and work in and out all day long, keeping the correct tension on this belt. If this seizes up and a wad goes in, we've got potential for catastrophic failure. So keeping that lubed up is very important. As we move on back, we've got the rest of our variable speed header drive. One thing I like to do before every season, summer and fall, even if you're not running a corn head, is to unhook our variable, our real drive, real lift, excuse me, here, and hook into the variable speed header drive. We have to unbolt our ring here, three half inch bolts, turn our ring so our pins come in. That's gonna allow these shivs to work in and out. Once we hook our hose into our variable speed header drive, we can now adjust our speed of our feeder chains with our real lift button. Go ahead and cycle them two or three times. That will lubricate this and keeps oil moving through it. When we're done and we wanna go back to wheat, simply run it back up and do a lockout, unhook our hose and put it back over here for real lift. So what that's doing, Josh, up front here, when you cycle that is you're moving the grease across those cams, right? So you get everything lubed up good. So you're also you're not wearing a certain part of those, right? That's exactly right. So like I said, whether you run a corn head or not, it's still important to get the grease moved around in here like what Robert was talking about. So while we're back in this area, final drives. It's always good to check our oil on our final drives. Real easy. This standpipe, we take the cap off of here, and I like to use a zip tie, but it's somewhere from the top eight to a quarter inch is where our oil should be. And it's always good just to look around and make sure we don't have any leaks or anything like that. The operator's manual does a good job explaining the hours on the oil changes. It's always good to, to uh, follow the op manual and uh, get our uh, lubrication changed when it's time. <clears throat> Whether you've got duals or singles, it's always good to go by, take a look at your hardware, make sure everything's tight. If you are running duals, eight to 10 pounds more on the inside tires compared to the outside. We want our duals the inside duel over our final drive to take the brunt of the weight. Very important. That takes less strain off of the final drive. What about the bolts here, Josh? Do we need to retort these every so often or are they gonna stay tight for us? If you have a new combine, the first eight to 10 hours, 600 foot pounds on the inner duels. If they move when you torque them another eight to 10 hours, we need to get back on them. It's the duels, the rim is just working its way into a home, and we need to make sure those are staying tight. We're going to go ahead and open up the side sheet here. So, here we have our def. We can pop this shield off with a half inch wrench. There's a filter in the underneath, which we can unscrew and change. I believe it calls for 1200 hours. I like to change it every year. It's, it's more of a preventive maintenance than anything. So that is really the only filter on the DEF system that you have to worry about. Uh, once again, it's just good to look at your DEF system, make sure we don't have no buildup, no white uh, crystallization, which would be a sign of a DEF leak. Um, and always run good, clean DEF in there. Um, Belt-wise, while we're standing here, it's always good to kind of sneak in here and look at your belts, make sure everything's running in line. We don't have no adjustments that need to be made. Quick way to do that is by looking at your idlers and you'll see on your idler uh, wall, if it's shiny on one side, it may be such a thing we need to get it aligned. Uh, we're set right now for corn. If you get a new machine, they come from the factory set with the slow speed on the chopper. This is our fast speed that will run on all the other crops. Just, we can untension this belt, 
Slip this one off, slip that one on, we're in fast speed. Another good thing to look at while we're standing here, shoe boards. The shoe board seals our grain from our clean grain and even our return, but it also keeps our shoe from walking back and forth. As you can see, new machine, this one's tight. There's no side to side play. As these get hours on them, these boards will wear. There's three bolts along here on this board. They can be loosened up and that board can be shoved in. If you've got a hotel key or a business card and you can slide that in between there, that's really where we want that board. So we have a gauge here on our belt, main drive belt. When it's tensioned correctly, our gauge is right at the end of our washer. So we know that we have a good tension on our belt. Um, we can also look back at our hydro belt, uh, which we'll get to when we go to the back. Um, we got sh uh, shoe bushings on our shaker shoe. Obviously a new combine, but when you can start seeing a gap between your castings, it's time to get new shoe bushings on. It's very important they get overlooked, but that is what makes our shoe so simple. The shoe bushings make that, it's almost if that shoe's riding on air, really works well. So we'll keep moving around back. Um, nothing really here on our spreader. We just wanna make sure that we don't have any bends on our spreader. Time to time I see we got a, a bent disc or a bent arm. It takes the balance out of this and really makes that work. It has the potential to work our bolts loose on the upside. Is there, Josh, is there some adjustment that they need to do on the paddles themselves? So there is adjustment on these bolts right here. We can loosen these up and we can adjust these to change whether we're spreading more to the left and more to the right. They come out of the factory set like this for max spread. So if you go and put a 30 foot head on, you may have to come back here and adjust these in so we're not throwing material into the crops or too far to the left. Uh, we're at our chaff spreader. Our chaff spreader is preset at the factory. There's no setting on it. We can swing it out of the way by uncoupling our quick couples, pulling this pin and we can get right into our shoe. We want to make sure we got our small grain or corn chaffer in here, depending on what you're going into. Sometimes it gets forgot, it's kind of hidden in there and guys will come out of corn and they're in wheat. Your sample's not very good. From here, we'll go ahead and open up the, the back end and we're gonna crawl in and take a couple look at the things on the engine and the uh, processor. So from here, we've got our hydraulic oil tank. We wanna be sure we've got Plenty of hydraulic oil in it. Once again, refer to the operator's manual on changing your fluids. We got our water, looks good. We can pop more shields off here to give us a better view of our belts. And to really check over the engine and make sure we haven't developed a leak or that we've got a belt that may be fraying if we got a combine with some hours on it. always want to check for cats too, right? Cats, raccoons, anything. They love to lay inside here by the radiator, especially if it's getting cold, um, your fall weather. It's not a bad idea to tap on the side of the combine. So we can see we've got alternator belt here, our aspirator belt, aspirator hose. This is a good one to to kind of keep an eye on because it can get some holes in it. So if we notice that our air filter starts plugging rather quickly, you know, we want to take a look at our aspirator fan down here. You can barely see it, but it's in there and you want to make sure we got good aspirator fan. And this hose doesn't have any holes that are starting to appear in it because that will go in and then plug our air filter quite quickly. We do have a reset button for our air filter here, which is good to keep an eye on but it's also a good idea to go ahead and pop our air filter out. Take a look at it and make sure there's nothing coming apart on it. Make sure we're not plugged up or if we need a new air filter, that's the time to do it. We want to look at the top of our aspirator. I see a lot of these aspirators tend to get dirt 
And a lot of times if you get caught in a rainstorm, which don't happen very often here in Kansas anymore, it can corrode this up and, and block some of our, our uh, venturis off, which in turn is a loss of power. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and open up the processor and take we're gonna take a look at the natural flow all right so as we jump in here first thing we want to look at is cage wear cage damage if we pick something up you know when we're in cutting beans we're sliding on the ground and things get in here want to make sure our bars we got good brass bars that we don't have any uneven wear. And if you've seen some of our other videos, they went through cage uh, concave leveling. It's always good to look at that every year. The more level our concave is, the better grain quality we're gonna have. So we wanna look down here at our accelerator rolls. We've got good ridges on our accelerator rolls. We'll run them until they are basically smooth. As everybody knows, the, the orange accelerator lugs, we get, we get great life out of them. It's been a, a, a huge update. In here, that's really the quick look over of, of, the, uh, of the natural flow processor. On the front side, we've got our fuel filters, which I would suggest changing fuel filters every year. It's, it's, it's cheap. You know, we got a lot of fuel running through here. Good fuel filters just make the combine perform so much better. We've got our engine oil right here. We can check engine oil. One good thing to look at is our uh, batteries. We wanna be sure this area is clean and it's, it's not gonna be able to short anything out because as it lays in there, it, it, it can form a layer of uh, debris in there. And if there's ever a doubt that you've got a bad battery, take them and get them checked or just replace them. There's so much electronics. If we've got a battery that's failing, that can lead to unknown error codes. It can uh, cause harm to something else in the system. So batteries are important. We got to move on to the, uh, to the radiator. There's another grease circuit that gets missed quite a bit and it's on our belt drive on our rotary screen and it's right here. And what that does, it lets that idler work in there. We find them uh, quite often that that's not greased. And if your rotary screen's not turning, pretty soon we start uh, not getting the airflow that we need. So we want to open up our air conditioner condenser. And even though we got reversing fan to keep our cooling package clean, still good to look inside and maybe reach up and give our slinger a spin to make sure we're not contacting anywhere. So if everything's good there, we'll go ahead and close it down. Move on up to our next area here. All right, so as we just keep moving forward, we got our return and clean grain. We want to just give these a little wiggle on both of them. And what we want to do to, for correct adjustment is just so we can slide them on the sprockets is what we want. And maybe crawl into there and take a look at that sprocket. Make sure we're not getting a hook in it where it's going to cause more wear to the chain. And it's a simple loosen up two bolts, shove it down and retighten. Our, our chains are tight that way. Once again, more belts. It's just looking at belts, being sure we've got the correct tension on our belts. There's measurements in the op manual for all our spring tension for our belts. What happens if we don't have the correct spring tension? Say, our, let's just use our separator drive for instance. If we don't have the correct tension, we start slipping our separator drive belt. The whole back half of this combine slows down. We lose shoe speed, we lose chopper speed then we lose performance. Very important to keep all of our spring adjusted to the correct length. Rotor gearbox. I like to change the oil in the rotor gearbox every year. Kind of tucked away, but we have a drain in the bottom right here. 
Holds about four quarts. I like to drain it every year. When we went to the DuraGuard gearbox, it made a huge improvement in the combine. Reliability is great with that gearbox, but, but it's, a, uh, it's a lubrication and all lubrication breaks down over time. This is our unloader belt, gone from the chain. Once again, 100% reliable. We just need to make sure that we track. Like I said, we're not wearing on our shoulders. If we're wearing on our shoulders, then we're, we're, we're out of line somewhere and we need to get in the line. This side is the same as the other side where we talked about the, the shoe board. It's just as important on this side as the other side. Our bushings, it's all just as important. If we do it to one side, we gotta do it to the other. Wanna to touch on the feed chains real quick here. They have got guides on them. So when we go around and service in the morning or you're getting ready to go to the field, we wanna be sure we're adjusted to our gauge. Our washer should be flat with our gauge. If we're not flat with our gauge, we either need to make an adjustment and tighten it up or take a half link out. So Josh, a lot of stuff going on over on this side, but one thing I hear about rotor drive belt, what, what should we be looking for on that as we're inspecting before the season? Is there something that we can look towards or what about uh, Sure. Maintenance to that part of it, because that does a lot of work throughout the harvest, right? Sure. So one thing with our gearbox, depending on the crop we're going in, we've got high and low. This one's set in low side right now, which was what we would run for corn. And you can see on the decal. So we want to go to high side, and get ready to cut some wheat. Now we're in high side. That's something good to make sure because a lot happens in the winter and you forget where you were. One thing to look at in here is to look in between our shivs and maybe in behind. These move in and out. This is how we adjust our rotor speed. If we have oil leaking in here, we could possibly potentially have an O-ring cut. So we need to make sure, and then that will get on our belt, then we get belt slippage. Once again, our performance drops. So while we're talking about our rotor drive, we have a grease circ on the end and one on the side of our hub for a rotor drive. These are very important and they need at least 15 to 20 shots every day. That very much is the same thing as what our feeder house variable speed drive does. It works like this in conjunction with the crop amount or crop flow that's going into our rotor. If that seizes up, we have the potential to tear up a rotor drive belt. So if that's lubed up as it works in and out, that's what's going to hold our rotor speed at the correct RPMs that were set in the combine. So we need to go through the same process with that as we did the variable speed where we grease it, speed it up, slow it down every so often so that we get the grease clear through. The Absolutely, side. Robert. And a good way to check the rotor variable speed and the header variable speed is one of two ways. You can take it and hit it and we've loosened up our belt because our shivs are greased correctly and it opened up and let our belt fall down in there. Now we'll take this and we can turn this combine. As you can see, our belt is back to tight. So everything is working correct. Yeah, that's a great point, Josh. That way you kind of know what's going on inside there. And you know, eventually things can wear as the machine gets older, right? Absolutely. Good way to check it before you get to harvest. Yes, absolutely. Because the more we get done before we get to the field, the more we get done when we get to the field, right? So I like to say that more maintenance in the off season is less downtime in season. season. Absolutely. The only other setup that we have to do to go to corn or vice versa to uh, small grains is to untension our belt, four bolts here, and flip this shiv around so we're running on the fast speed for the feeder house. All right, so Josh, we're up here in the cab. Is there some things that we need to do in here to get the combine ready to go to the next crop? For sure, Robert. What we want to do, we get our combine fired up, menu brought up. What we need to do is go into our little combine and then into our calibration menu. Here is all our calibrations that, that we can go through. It's always good to walk through all your calibrations before you go to the field. Yeah, each 
each crop, right? Each time you take it to the field, it's always good. Things wear, things change. Yep. Right. Yep. Recalibrate it, and then everything is good to go, right? Well, different yields, even in wheat or corn, can change what's coming into the grain bin. So a quick, easy one for our sh is for our shaft speed. Once we select shaft speed, it will walk you step by step. As you can see here, three steps. Hit the green button. It'll do its calibration. If everything's correct, it'll say calibration passed. If not, it will tell you which part did not pass. And that's what we need to go back to and look and see whether we got a sensor that's out or a belt slipping or whatever the issue may be. Once again, we got real calibration. Another one, good one to, to, uh, to do if you are, especially if you're running automatic reel speed, um, makes your automatic reel speed work so much better. Threshing and cleaning, we can zero out our concave, chaffer, sieve calibration, our air choke calibration, and yield calibration, such as what Robert was talking about. We want to do our yield calibrations because we want to be as accurate as possible. Right. We have guidance and sensor calibrations. This is a big one. If you're getting a crazy line that's not wanting to track, for running wasps especially, things are moving in the sky all the time. And if we let it set, we may have to come out and do a wheel angle sensor calibration. If we're in uh, corn, we've got row sensor, you know, we want to do a row sense calibration so we can follow our rows. Right. And so, once again, these will walk you step by step through there what needs to be done on that. Absolutely. And, all this stuff is extremely important, right? If you want to get the maximum performance out of all these really cool features that we put in the machine, right? But but they got to be set and absolutely. then they work, they work really, really well. Absolutely. So with that, well, that'll give us a quick rundown of getting this machine ready to go to the field. But like I said earlier, Robert, the more maintenance in the off season is more uptime in season. Absolutely. I think everyone has said, uh, everybody understands that very well, right? And how important all this is uh, to get. So when you get to the field, you're actually getting the job done, right? Right. Absolutely. Nobody wants to sit at the edge of the field. All good stuff, Josh. Excellent stuff. Okay. So Josh, thank you so much for walking us around the combine and really looking at some of these things to, you know, little things uh, to get our combines ready to go for that next harvest, which is coming up pretty quick. And, you know, there's going to be other things too, but, you know, talk to your dealer, right? These are some simple things that you can look at. And, uh, and then if you're out on the harvest run, well, then you can uh, check with Mr. Wagner here because he's going to be out there uh, running from Texas clear to uh, North Dakota. So we're going to cover a lot of area again. And the tech band's been doing this since 1969. They pioneered this thing. You know, this is, this is important. So we'll be starting in Vernon and we follow the cutters. You know, where they go, we go. That's what we're there for. Well, thanks again, Josh. And uh, we'll see you when you get home. September. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Aaron, we're, we're coming to the close of a little bit of a lengthy episode. But Still we have a lot have of information, a, right? A lot, a lot of stuff <laughs> that we wanted to talk about, right? But, you know, from, from uh, family photo to going out and watching the mainframe come together and then really reviewing that and then the walk around with Josh. You know, Great information. Right? All the stuff. Yeah. So, uh, I know we put a lot of stuff out there, but, but there's a lot to talk about. Here, yeah. Right. And and there's more stuff coming too. Right. Yeah. We got some exciting stuff happening here, real quick. Exactly. So the so, centennial stuff that we're putting together, like we we're going to be out and about. So we're going to be in a couple places here coming up here in the next couple months. Or is we're going to be in Gossel, Gossel, Kansas, for yes. the the country threshing days. Yes. And uh, I, the yep. Gleaner Combine is the featured product that's going to be there, right? Absolutely. So the show is featuring the Gleaner because it's 100 years, right? We're talking about it. We got our uh, wrapped, wrapped in, in history. history combine right here, <laughs> and this dude's going to be in the parade there, well, along awesome. with hopefully a lot of other. Uh, vintage cleaner combines that customers right. are going to bring in and we encourage everybody to bring their machines right yeah. join us in the parade and then after the parade right we're going to go out and park them we have acres that they laid out for us to park our a lot of space cleaners. to fill so yes. we need as many cleaners as possible we need a lot of them out there <laughs> and we're going to park them out there and then we're going to do some uh some history stuff 
Hopefully there'll be a few t-shirts, hats, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. If you need to load up on some of your cleaner merch, right? Good swag, right? Absolutely. So, and, and that's not, you know, it keeps going because then we're going to be at Farm Progress with this. That's the main feature, right? That's yep. where we're having the big celebration. Yep. So there'll be a big celebration there. And then, uh, and then there's more later in the fall. So, so stay yeah, tuned, right? A celebration has started. Absolutely. <laughs> So again, thanks folks for sticking around. Again, it was a long episode, but hopefully we brought you a lot of great information that you can you can really take and useful useful information, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, that's and, what it's about. And again, that's why we're doing it. That's why we continue to do this. And, and we just want to thank you folks. And uh, again, social media, right? That's Absolutely. the best place to get a hold of us, to really talk with us. And if you folks have some some pictures or some, some videos of your cleaner combines in action, I know we've got weed harvest going on right now. Yes, we uh, do send it to us we know Absolutely. you're proud of it we want to see it we love seeing it so make sure you follow us on twitter yep. on facebook, facebook. Yep. and on youtube Gleaner combines tv absolutely that's where all this stuff is going so, to be yeah. right so all cool. right great well we'll see you next time and thanks right. again